Welcome, all you happy warriors, to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where I, your rabbi, reveal how the world really works. And one way the world really works is that fools do not become geniuses overnight. And uh, number two, track record really counts. If somebody has been making an almighty mess of things up till now, uh, there really is no reason to assume that his pattern in life is going to change dramatically. And so as I prepare this uh, program for you in the middle of June 2022, uh, you probably might have noticed that you do not hear much of Ukraine on the pages anymore. No longer are celebrities agitating for more money for Ukraine. Um, even the uh, officials in the Democratic Party who so eagerly shoveled $40 billion of money at the Ukrainians while America is suffering with uh, inflated currency and rising prices everywhere with interest rates just having pushed up another 75 basis points. And so uh, you'll notice you're not hearing the cries of triumphalism from Ukraine. Oh, the victories of the genius uh, Zelensky. Oh, he's decimating the, um, the Russian military. Have you noticed that that's like all gone from the front pages? You don't hear that anymore. And uh, you might wonder why that would be. And so uh, your rabbi will give you a very brief little insight on that before we move on to, well, things that are more relevant to this podcast, to this show. And the, the reason for that is that for the, look, let's, let's put it this way. Um, everybody, Russia, America, China, have all been working <clears throat> for the last few decades on 21st century warfare space-based weapons and drones, of course, old hat, that a person sitting at the desert in Nevada blows up a terrorist car in the Middle East. Uh, all, all of this is what we've been doing. Now, one of the reasons, many reasons, that America did so badly in Afghanistan and other parts of the Middle East is because if you are geared up for a 21st century uh, battle, and your enemy is using uh, medieval methods, you are going to have trouble. Now, eventually you should be able to prevail. But um, in this case, the Ukrainians are essentially working with World War II equipment other than the, um, the gear that America has sent over and some of the other NATO people have sent over, uh, NATO countries, I should say. But other than that, uh, the uh, the basic Ukrainian um, artillery corps and the ammunition uh, reserves that they have are essentially World War II type stuff. And uh, the Russians, no different from America in the sense that uh, they've been gearing up for 21st century, not, not surprisingly, had a few months of adjustment. Well, they've adjusted and uh, they've brought to bear overwhelming power. Um, my understanding is that uh, Ukrainian, art you know, you've heard a lot about artillery bombings. Ukrainian artillery is outgunned about 20, 30, or maybe even 40 to 1. Even 10 to 1 is a calamity, but 40 to 1 is invincible. And so uh, right now, you're gearing up for another Afghanistan. Biden and his... Um, uh, Secretary of Defense Austin, they've been crowing for a long time. Oh, we're going to reduce Russia to the point where they're never going to be able to do anything like this again. Yeah, that's not exactly going to happen. And uh, we've got another Afghanistan basically happening. Anytime about now, expect to hear the American president starting to explain why um, Zelensky didn't listen to him. And that's why things are going badly. It'll be something along those lines. And basically, um, this is going to end up as a negotiated uh, uh, end. Um, Russia will get all the property, all the land at once on the east of Ukraine in order to achieve what America achieved in the uh, 1962 missile crisis 
when Cuba placed uh, Rus uh, Russian missiles on America's doorstep. Uh, the um, Minsk agreement uh, stressed, as, as all wise American leaders did many, many years ago, that uh, Russia should not be provoked by having uh, NATO or American missiles on its border. Uh, that's all what this was really all about. It was just foolishness of the West precipitating what smart diplomats like George Kennan and Henry Kissinger years and years ago said was going to happen, and sure enough did. So right now, uh, you're not going to hear about sending more stuff to Ukraine. You're not going to hear about sending more money to Ukraine. The whole note of triumphalism, oh, Ukraine is doing brilliantly. That's all gone. You're not going to hear any more of that because they're not. And uh, the um, uh, the result is going to be that, uh, as I say, it'll be negotiated either by some of the NATO countries or perhaps by America. But bottom line is, uh, once again, the American president has um, created a calamity. And he's going to blame almost everybody for this except himself. Uh, and as I told you months ago already, towards the beginning of 2022, uh, I did talk a lot about why this was not a good war for America to get involved in in any way, shape, or form, but uh, America did, and it is a disaster. That about is all the news, right? That 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 covers up most of what is uh, what is happening um, around the world, and I think it's far more important that we dive into things that can help your life. What parts of your life? Well, you know already, your five critical Fs, your five fundamental Fs, your family, your finance, your fitness, your friendships, and your faith. And if, if you've got those things in good shape, think about it. Imagine having an extremely satisfying and fulfilling marriage, having a, a wonderful family, having a great social circle of lovely friends. Imagine being in good health and imagine not having money worries. And on top of that, um, God smiles at you from time to time. You know, you don't have much in life to complain about. And so let's get down to things that can really be useful to you. Um, the politics has to be looked at from time to time. Um, and to be perfectly honest, even though it is unseemly and I should be able to rise above it, <clears throat> I kind of like saying I told you so every now and then, just to remind you right, that your rabbi brings value to you, to every happy warrior. <laughs> okay, enough of the uh, patting on the back and the self-promotion. And let's face the one huge political reality that can be learned from well, I think if we go back to 1962 again, all right, take a look. Uh, those 60 years from 1962 till now, uh, one of the things that's been learned is that public perception shapes real life outcomes, right? What people get managed to be persuaded, the role of the media, hugely important because that really does shape uh, real life outcomes. And um, one of the frightening changes during this period has been a war on money, a war on wealth. And it's been conducted in response to the public perception that somehow the rich got that way by stealing from the poor. <laughs> it's probably a few people listening. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's exactly how the rich got the rich, by stealing from the poor. Well, not exactly. And uh, that's not really how the world works. At any rate, this perception uh, does include the notion that wealth producing activities are um, unseemly uh, and that economic activity causes rather than cures poverty. There's a way to restore the prestige of business success, uh, but it requires a return to tradition. And you remember how I defined tradition for you a few shows back? Tradition is a set of solutions for problems you haven't yet recognized. And in order to examine this, we've, we're going to take a quick look at understanding the nature of money. And um, 
I've told you before, money is spiritual, not physical. Uh, it's not discs of metal or strips of paper or a handshake or writing a check. Uh, money is very, very intangible. It's an extraordinary thing. It's, it, it, it has to do with the relationship between people. Uh, it, it speaks of you having served another person if you have money in your pocket. It also is the world's most important information communication system. And so uh, what people should work at, like somebody is leaving school now, wants to start working. How does that person know what they should be doing? It's very simple. You should be doing what pays the best. Well, what about doing what you love? No, your rabbis told you this many times. You must learn to love what you must do. You don't do what you already love. That is indulgent and leads to calamity. A lot of calamity talk today. And so uh, <clears throat> that is something that, that, that really is, is very clear. How do you know what is needed out there? Just look and see what pays. Because the money communication system has already spotted that there is a shortage of, um, you know, in formula manufactured uh, milk for babies, okay? So maybe you should go into that business, except maybe not because it's being dealt with already. But what money does is show what your whereabout in the economic system, your efforts are needed. And the way it does that is by a lot of money. And so uh, people who wasted huge sums of money, borrowed money in order to go to college, uh, in order to study things that have little or no um, value economically, are learning their lesson now. And of course, they are screaming at President Biden to cancel their student debt, which would be an absolutely disastrous thing, other than for a few people who have a lot of student debt. A lot of people may be, but still it's wrong in every possible way and it will have tremendously damaging outcomes. Um, and so it's a real mistake, which is probably a good indication that that's exactly what Mr. Biden is going to do soon. But uh, let's take a look at money. Um, the uh, Long before our computer-controlled virtual laboratories, Albert Einstein um, came up with his idea of thought experiments. And thought experiments allowed him to solve problems for which actual laboratory experiments would have proven too expensive, if, if not impossible, to conduct. Rather than measuring gravity in an elevator dropping down a three-mile elevator shaft, the great physicist showed that we can just as well and a, a lot more safely analyze the situation from the comfort of our living rooms. Uh, in the social sciences, this, uh, this is also true. We can make excellent use of thought experiments. Uh, Charles Murray uh, wrote a book a number of years ago called Losing Ground, and it was an early uh, harbinger of the decline of the United States of America. Uh, following Charles Murray's example, let's conduct a thought experiment to see if we can understand the origin of our own calendar, shall we? Uh, this is how we're going to do it. This is all a thought experiment, please. Do not call Child Protective Services on me. I'm not doing this to real children. This is a thought experiment, please. Okay, uh, we take a young boy and a young girl and we place them on an otherwise deserted tropical island. Uh, we make sure that there's enough food, that there's no dangerous animals around, and uh, we set up concealed surveillance equipment so that we can watch what's going on. Well, I think we can assume that, uh, you know, stipulating that they, uh, that they uh, survive, they grow, and they get bigger and older and they develop, I think we can assume that they will discover procreation and reproduction, and that after a century or two, as we watch them through our surveillance equipment, uh, there'll be a whole bunch of them, a lot of them. And they're now sort of a full-fledged society. And so the thought experiment involves asking ourselves, um, you know, what sort of things are going to happen then, what sort of things won't happen. 
I think we're going to assume that they will remain oblivious of any other people or any human history. We're going to keep them in the dark. They don't know anything about anyone else. They're not in communicate. They don't know of any other people. And, um, and, and this is still early, right? They're in their stone age or, or maybe after that, maybe they're starting to find how to create iron, how to work with iron. Anyways, um, how about calendar? Would you agree with me that they will certainly notice a periodicity um, in the heavens? And they'll, they'll see that the sun uh, moves and the, um, or the earth rotates. Well, either way, relatively, they're going to see the sun moves. And they'll figure out uh, that there are days. And then they'll watch the uh, shadow of the sun at midday. A process around an ellipse and they'll realize there's a thing called a year of 365 days and after who knows how many centuries of experience as we continue watching this tribe on our island um, they will figure out that a lunar month is about 30 days so you know they'll probably end up with about uh, 12 lunar months to, to a year. It's more than likely because 365 days. Um, okay, so then you know what they might do? They say, you know what, let's make every second month have an extra day. So we'll have months having 30 days, then 31 days, then 30 days. That'll come out to be 366 days in the year. And it's still going to be a little out, which means that each year uh, it, it's going to move rel the, the, uh, the, the month calendar and the, the solar, the year calendar are going to move, which is inconvenient uh, for arranging play dates and parties and business meetings. So what they'll do is they'll, uh, they'll make it 366 days and then they'll chop a day off uh, February or one of the months every four years. Little by little, they'll home in on making the... Uh, uh, the month system correspond to the year system. And then let's say they're going to decide they want a shorter time frame, right? They got days, they got months and years, but how about something between days and months? Wouldn't that be nice? It would be really convenient, especially for people who don't like waiting for 31 days to be paid. Uh, so wouldn't it be nice if we had something shorter? Here's my question to you. Here's the thought experiment. Uh, how many days would they come up with you know, on this island, do you think? And don't say seven, because that means you're not thinking, you're just spouting out what comes to mind right away. But if you stop to think about it, you'll realize there is absolutely no way on earth that our remote but rapidly developing and growing tribe will come up with a seven-day week. It simply cannot happen. All right? Why? Because seven doesn't divide into 30 for the days of the month, and seven doesn't divide into 365, it leaves a remainder of two, and so that means that every year you need a different calendar. But imagine if they hit on the idea of a five-day week, and they standardized on a 30-day uh, month and a 365-day year. And then once a year or once every four years, they do an adjustment that fixes everything up again and make, you know, accounting for the slight errors in the system. But wouldn't this be a neat system? You have exactly six of these kind of weeks in a month, right? Um, six times five, you've got a five-day week, six of them in a month, and then you've got 72 of them in a year. And everything is so nice because 5 divides evenly into 365, you see. One thing you will agree with me on that is there's no way on earth they ever would have come up with a 7-day week. It makes no sense. So how come there is a 7-day seven-day week around the world today? And uh, the answer is... And, and there is no other answer, by the way. This is an incredibly disturbing answer to many people, but it is the only answer, and that is that we human beings um, have retained in our um, deep, primeval, collective memory that long ago God created the world in six days and on the seventh day he rested, setting up a seven-day cycle as a sort of divine circadian rhythm. Uh, it really is hard to 
account in any other way for the wide acceptance of a seven-day week throughout history. Yes, there have been isolated civilizations that haven't lasted for very long. I think the Incas had a different uh, basis. However, in the mainstream of the development of civilization, it's always been a seven-day week. And um, just as the seven-day week is the product of a collective memory of a religious tradition, so too is money. You see, <clears throat> while our while our clandestine surveillance of the island will certainly reveal that the islanders are bartering with one another, I think it is considerably less certain that they will make the leap of assigning value to discs of metal or to seashells. That, in all probability, would not happen on our island. As, indeed, it wouldn't happen on the island, right? In exactly the same way as it failed to happen in many parts of the real world. Most populations that were isolated from Bible-based Western tradition failed to make the leap from barter to coins and capital. And so, yes, uh, there, was, there were coins in early Israel. You know, you can see them in archaeological digs in, in Israel to the present day. And you'll find there were coins in, uh, in Greece and there were coins in Rome. All of these sprang from this fundamental idea. And it's a huge idea. While the Bible served as the earliest source of wisdom, it helped people grasp the role of gold and silver. People learned how to expand trade and therefore wealth uh, by employing precious metals as an exchange medium. They understood the role of private property and the role of the law in protecting that property. Naturally, these people enjoyed a gigantic head start over, the, over those um, who had to discover all this by trial and error. There was another reason why those Western civilizations based on the Bible flourished economically. The individual character traits that Judeo-Christian Bible-based thinking promotes are the very qualities that best prepare people for effective roles in commerce. One of the most important of these is faith. Yeah, that's right, one of our Fs. Because this accustoms people to the real world, wherein almost every worthwhile venture requires one to make a major commitment without assurance of success. An investment, planting an orchard, taking on a new job. That's where your faith muscle needs to be developed and working. Um, marriage. Think of couples who have to marry without the help of a crystal ball that would predict all the ups and downs of their life ahead. Farmers plant and await crops that may or may not grow. And of course, investments of capital always do involve risk. I'd go further than that, my dear friends. Happy warriors all. And I would say that the very act of accepting metal discs or even pieces of paper in exchange for a day of back-breaking labor, that requires enormous faith. Inflation undermines that, of course. And that's one of the reasons that I explain how inflation is a moral problem, not a financial problem. Please don't for a moment think that the uh, Federal Reserve raising interest rates in the United States by another three quarters of a percent, oh, that's going to magically solve inflation. No, it won't. All it will do is suppress demand. You know, those people will stop buying things. So it'll camouflage inflation. It'll stop people buying things, which means that uh, storekeepers and factories and uh, everybody will have res residuals of unsold inventory of everything, real estate also, and prices will actually come down. But in this case, the uh, cure may well be much worse than the disease. Actually, I think we saw a little bit of that in uh, COVID already, too. 
but um, and so sadly we may be accustomed to it. But um, it's it's important to realize the role of faith. In other words, I can accept payment for you from you for doing a day's work for you, only because I have faith that first of all the food I need for my family will be available to me in exchange for that money. And secondly, that that money is going to retain its value. Government betrays the civ the population. Government betrays citizens. Government betrays their country when they allow the money to become corrupt, which is exactly what happens when you print too much of it. That's what causes inflation. Uh, so, yeah, uh, investments of every kind involve risk, and therefore it takes faith in order to get people to do them. Um, the, the, um, to understand the real role of faith, notice what things change, how things change in its absence. When investors lose faith in the markets, when depositors lose faith in banks, when citizens lose faith in the currency, disaster strikes, or as my word of today, calamity arrives. As long as the faith habit is intact, people will accept payment for their goods and services. They do that because they've got faith that when they require some commodity like milk or eggs or gasoline, some vendor or other will accept their little metal discs or scraps of paper and give them what they want. As long as the future, however, remains uncertain, people who maintain a faith in their lives enjoy a huge advantage, whether as spouses, parents, farmers, investors, business professionals. That's right. Judeo-Christian thought nurtures another personality trait, which serves well for everyone who practices capitalism and that is deferment of gratification. A religious outlook helps to promote saving rather than impulse spending. It also inculcates in people the idea that there is merit in doing the right thing for its own sake rather than for the reward. This too is a valuable mindset for the ambitious entrepreneur who has to focus on filling a need rather than focusing on how to get hold of other people's money. Everybody wants money, but those who pursue it directly instead of seeking a niche usually fail. The most conspicuous commercial successes are won by those who find a way to serve other people and provide them with what they want. Religious teachings that emphasize the virtue of charity would thus fit well into business school curricula. Because charity helps to loosen the tight grip that many of us have on our money. No miser ever made a great investor. Religion encourages people to raise families, the best incubators of capitalism. There, the young future business professional learns the value of labor and its specialization. From wise and responsible parents, the child learns all the skills necessary for their first job. They will not learn those things from a geek. I guarantee you that. A geek? Is there anybody listening who doesn't know what a geek is? Well, I can't believe that. You all know what a GIC is. I, 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 I mean, are there brand new listeners? People who've just tuned in today for the first time? Okay, fine. A geek is a government indoctrination camp. It's what used to be called public schools in the old days. And so uh, a, child, a child learns everything he needs to know about getting his first job from his parents. And um, another thing about family is um, family is valuable because very few um, large commercial enterprises get built in one generation. And lastly, it's children that fuel parents' ambition to drive themselves 
beyond the needs of their own lifetime. And you see this right away. I mean, every single time that countries have raised what they, they don't like me calling it the death tax, but it's the right name for it. Whenever countries make it increasingly difficult to have any money to pass on to your children, the gross domestic product drops. People stop working because the deep desire to provide for your children is hugely important. And that's one of the reasons why when a country is on its decline, the fertility rate goes down dramatically from the bare minimum of 2.1, which just maintains the same population, which is not good enough for a thriving economy. Um, and the population drops usually as the uh, as a, it goes hand in hand with a lack of faith. And you can see um, in America, cultures and societies that still are built around faith. Take the Latter-day Saints Church, for instance, in the state of Utah. Uh, you'll find that um, uh, fertility figures there are much healthier than in Nevada, which is a neighboring state and very similar demographically. The only difference between Nevada and Utah is faith, and it has huge impacts. There's no, no question about that. Um, what else do we know about money? Well, think about physical and spiritual. Uh, all human activities, I think all, I can't think of exceptions, all human activities can be placed on a um, spectrum line that has at one end of the spectrum line spirituality and the other end physicality. So, for instance, if I say, where on the spectrum line would you place prayer, praying to God? Would you place it on the P end or the S end, on the physical end or the spiritual end? Where about does praying belong? And so I'd say, you know, really, really close to the spiritual end of the spectrum. Uh, reading, also there. Writing, yeah, there. Composing music, all of those things I'd put you know, closer to the spiritual end of the spectrum. Um, how's about um, the uh, physical act of intimacy? Where does that belong? I mean, as, as the source of great sensual pleasure, but then also as the source of all new life, we might locate that activity sort of mid-spectrum maybe. I mean, it's obviously physical, but if you try and strip away the spiritual part of it, it's very unsatisfying, not only for women, but for men as well. So it probably maybe might be in the center of the spectrum. How about eating? Eating, I'd move over to the P end, over to the physical end. Uh, how about uh, relieving oneself in the bathroom? I'd have that over at the physical end. Where would you put commercial transactions? It's so worth thinking about. The act of walking into a store, exchanging money, giving the money to the storekeeper, and walking out with a brand new pair of shoes with LED bulbs that flash in the heel when you walk. What That activity of buying shoes, where would you put that? And um, let, me, let me let you think about that a little bit. Now, one helpful way of identifying a spiritual act is by checking to see whether your pet chimpanzee would understand what's going on. Right? And the reason I say this is because God endowed human beings with his spirit and so he distinguished between a human being and a chimpanzee. So when I return home from work and slump into a comfortable armchair, a primate could probably understand. He could even sympathize with me. As I move to the dinner table and begin eating, my chimpanzee absolutely gets it. But when I sit down and open a newspaper and I hold it in front of my face, he becomes confused. I open a book, he, he almost looks confused. And this test shows us that a business transaction is more spiritual than physical. 
a chimpanzee would not have the slightest idea of what is going on between the shop owner and the customer. Economic exchange happens only after two independent, free, thinking human beings will it to happen. The process is really spiritual. Human beings are always slightly uneasy about pursuits that have no spiritual overtones at all. When necessary, we even superimpose spirituality precisely to avoid seeing, seeming as if we're doing something that's exclusively physical and thus uh, sort of uncomfortably animal-like for our souls to tolerate. We apply ceremony and ritual to our actions um, that are also animalistic. You see, only people read a book or listen to music, so those activities require no associated ritual or ceremony. But on the other hand, all living creatures eat and engage in reproductive activity, and they give birth and they die. If we do not confer a uniquely human ritual upon those functions of you know, eating and drinking and engaging in uh, reproductive activity and giving birth and dying, if we don't put uniquely human ritual onto those things, we, we find that we've taken away the distinction between ourselves and animals, which bothers our souls. Therefore, we celebrate the birth of a child, often by a naming ceremony. No animal does that. Even if our hands are quite clean, we wash them before eating rather than afterwards like a cat. We prefer to serve food in dishes on a tablecloth rather than straight out of the can. Although the physical nutritional qualities have not been enhanced at all, we still prefer it because we don't want to eat in the same way an animal does. It bothers us subconsciously. Our spirit is disturbed by that. So um, uh, we, we even say a grace, by the way, or a, a, a blessing or a benediction uh, before and sometimes after a meal. All of these things help to make the act of eating holy rather than animalistic. Uh, after encountering an attractive potential life mate, people do not proceed directly to physical intimacy, an engagement announcement, then a marriage ceremony. All of that serves to accentuate these important distinctions. After all, no animal announces its intention to mate and then defers gratification for three months while it calmly prepares its wedding and its future home? No, only human beings do that. And we do it to distinguish ourselves from animals. The more physical the activity, the more awkwardness and subconscious embarrassment surround it. Um, nudism. Nudism, I'm very interested in because I've noticed that it is practiced with with an almost funny bravado in order to conceal the underlying tension. Um, there was a great photographer, he's been gone for many years, I think. His name was Richard Avedon. And uh, he really broke a bit of a barrier by taking photographs of people while they eat. If you think about it, you know, we don't look attractive while we eat. And uh, like when the royal family in England eats, there are no cameras around. They're never, ever able to be photographed while eating. And you think about it that, you know, even if uh, you take a picture of your Thanksgiving table, you really want to make sure that nobody has a mouthful or is busy chewing uh, while you take the picture, right? And um, it, because when you take a picture of somebody eating, the the chewing is frozen in time. And at that moment, we resemble apes, not angels. Our mothers, raised in, in some variation, perhaps, of the Judeo-Christian tradition, actually taught us never to eat in public. And in the same way, we express a completely normal and natural 
and healthy reticence about bathroom activities. On the other hand, as purely spiritual occupations, reading books or looking at art evoke no spiritual discomfort in us at all. Likewise, buying and selling should evoke no psychic discomfort, right? Economic activity is another way in which we satisfyingly distance ourselves from animals. In that sense, we justify our humanity. And this helps to explain why the most secular elements in America always lead assaults on the free market. Those who have rejected religion are eager to find other outlets for their moral expression. There is no better way than to exhibit a revulsion for democratic capitalism. Today we hear people referring to the 80s, you know, as a period of moral depravity. Being unaware of the spiritual nature of money and of wealth creation, those individuals consider the miracle of profitable and productive economic enterprise to be the human equivalent of dogs fighting over a bone. The great historic clash between socialism and the traditional wisdom of the West is really just a reflection of a far more fundamental disagreement. This is over the question of the origin of man. This is not a question that needs to be debated in churches and divinity schools as much as it is a question that needs to be settled in corporate boardrooms and university uh, councils and business schools. Either God created us or we evolved from primeval protein sludge passing through a primate-like phase on the way. You know, as I've often told you, there is not a third alternative. And, uh, and the entire legitimacy of money and the role that money plays is best understood from a Judeo-Christian faith-based direction. And that's why Marxism and socialism and progressivism, and the way that uh, the European Union and Great Britain and America are moving in the direction of socialism corresponds exactly to their moving at the same time in the direction of secularism. And so, you know, for many years, I think people used to believe that we could take away religion and replace it with a sort of benign form of nothingness where everybody would just love one another and be nice to each other. And we don't need all the uh, superstitious nonsense of religion. Well, it's turned out that religion does a whole lot more than that. Secularism does not provide a benign neutrality. It provides a dark and sinister apocalyptic environment. Calamity, again. And so we've got to be aware that all five of our Fs do belong together. Please, please realize that at no time should any one of them be ignored. As a matter of fact, at no less an interval than once a week, you should ask yourself what's going on. Some people need to do it every day to begin with, and then you can switch to a weekly program. And what I mean by weekly program is where you stop and you get yourself private somewhere where no one's going to disturb you and you don't have your phone there. And you sit down with a piece of paper and you say, okay, here are my five F's. And you write, you write down family, finance, friendships, fitness, faith. And now you go one by one and you say, how did I do? Did I make any progress? What benefit, what development, what advantage, in what way have I improved each one of these things? You go down them one by one. And if you have trouble seeing, well, I haven't actually done anything to, to build my family this week. I just ignored it. I was too busy with work. No, finance, yes, family, yes, those two too go together. You can't ignore one for the other. 
And uh, heaven forbid, you've got to look and see if you've slid back on any of them. That's terrible. Then you really have to be focused. But uh, if, I, if I leave you with something important from uh, today's show, it would be that uh, you really ought to have a, a weekly or, if necessary, a daily reckoning. Most, for most people, a week weekly works. But if you're in not great shape, you should start with a daily reckoning and then build up to a weekly reckoning. And you go through exactly each of the five things in great detail and said, you know, how have you improved them this past week? And then say, now, what plan can I put in place for next week? So that when I next week review my five Fs, I won't be like I am this week when I have to say, well, I haven't really done anything. What plan? What am I going to do to improve each one of these five things? And that turns out to be enormously effective as a tool of moving onwards, going onwards and upwards. That's as far as we'll go for today. The website, rabbidaniellappin.com. And um, until next week, I want to wish you a week of growth. That's right. Real development with your family and your faith, with your finance and your friendships and your physical fitness. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin. God bless.